hold back for today's situation of reading a book. As a reminder of background noise is for as the Slytherin common room soundscape available on um, ambient mi mixer. If anyone wants the link to that, let me know. Um, also, as a quick reminder, while I'm reading, I'm I've got my sim idling reading a book. Um, her stats are frozen so that she doesn't randomly stop and I have to redo her cue. Um, what else? Oh yeah, while I'm reading I am not exactly paying attention to the chat log so any kind of entries in the chat log will take a fair it will take a long time for me to respond to if I respond to them at all. Um, so let's get started. Back up reading Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. We left off at the chapter transition of chapter seven. Alright. Chapter seven in which Simarine and Kazul make a journey underground. Simarin was surprised to hear that Kazul intended to take her along to visit on the visit to Morrowind, and she was not entirely sure she liked the idea. She had heard a great deal about the Enchanted Forest, and none of it was reassuring. People who traveled there were always getting changed into flowers or trees or animals or rocks or doing something careless and having their heads turned backward, or being carrying off, carried off by ogres or giants or trolls, or enchanted by witches or wicked fairies. It did not sound like a good place for a casual, pleasant visit. On the other hand, it seemed unlikely that anything dreadful would happen to Simmerine if she were traveling with a dragon, and she was looking forward to seeing Marwan again. Besides, Simmerine was curious. And anyway, she said to herself, Kazul says I'm going and there's no point in worrying about it if I don't have any choice. Nevertheless, she decided to take one of the smaller magic swords along with her, if Kazul said it was alright. Simmerine saw no point in taking unnecessary chances. Kazul had no objections, so Simmerine picked out a small, plain-looking sword in a worn leather scabbard that made the wearer invincible, and they started off. Simmerine had assumed that Kazul would fly through the pass, but Kazul said no. It's not that easy to get into the Enchanted Forest, she explained, at least not if you're trying to get in. Princes and youngest sons and particularly clever tailors stumble into it by accident all the time. But if one wants to get there on purpose, to go there on purpose, one has to follow the proper route. I didn't think dragons had that kind of problem, Simmerine said. Dragons don't, Kazul replied. But you're not a dragon. So instead of flying through the pass of silver ice, Kazul led Simmerine through the tunnels. Simmerine had to walk very quickly to keep up, even, the, even though Kazul was moving slowly. It was not long before she was wishing that the tunnels were high enough for her to ride on Kazul's back. The route twisted around and up and back and forth and down and around again until Simmerine was thoroughly lost. Finally, they came to a gate made of iron bars that completely blocked the passage. Simmerine studied it carefully, but she could not see no sign. But she could see no sign of a handle or a lock. This is the entrance to the caves of the to the caves of fire and night. 
Kazul said. Be careful from here on and don't wander away or you'll get lost. Simarine refrained from saying that as far as she was concerned they were lost already. How are you going to open it? She asked instead. Like this, said Kazul. By night in flame and shining rock, open thou thy hidden lock. Alboro Lingon. Try saying that word three times fast. I can't even barely say it normal speed. Ahem. <laughs> Back to it. As the sound of Kazul's voice died away, the iron gate swung silently open. That's a very usual, unusual opening spell, Simarine commented, impressed. It wasn't always that complicated, Kazul said. She sounded almost apologetic. I believe the first version was very simple, just open sesame. But word got around and we had to change it. Simarine nodded and followed Kazul through the gate and into the cave's fire and night. For the first hundred yards, you're... Ah. Pardon me. For the first hundred yards or so, the only difference Simmerine could see between these caves and the ordinary tunnels on the other side of the gate was that the caves of fire and night were warmer. Then, very suddenly, her lamp went out, plunging everything into complete and utter blackness. Simmerine stopped walking immediately. Kazul, it's quite all right, princess, Kazul's disembodied voice said from out of the darkness. This happens all the time here. Don't bother trying to relight the lamp. Just put your hand on my elbow and follow along that way. All right, Simarine said doubtfully. She groped with her free hand in the direction of Kazul's voice and scraped her knuckles on the dragon scales. Ow! Take your time. Kazul advised, I'm ready, Simarine said. Her right hand was pressed flat against the cool, rough-edged scales at the back of Kazul's left forearm. Just don't move too fast or I'll lose you or get stepped on or something. Kazul did her best to oblige, but Simarine still had difficulty in keeping up. She had to take at least three steps for every one of Kazul's, and it seemed that every time she moved her foot, she hit a rock or an uneven place in the f tunnel floor. Then she would stumble, and her hand would scrape and slide against Kazul's scales, so that she was afraid she would lose contact with, with the dragon. Are you sure I shouldn't try and relight the lamp? Samarine asked after her fifth painful stumble and slide. Quite sure, Kazul said. You see, it isn't... Ah, there it goes. While Kazul was speaking, there was a flicker of light, and then the darkness rolled aside like a curtain being pulled. Simmerine found herself standing in a large cave whose walls glittered as if they were studded with thousands of tiny mirrors. The lamp in her left hand was burning cheerfully once more. Was it the lamp? Simmerine asked after studying for the, it for a moment. Or was it me? It was the caves, Kazul said. That was one of the reasons they're of night, as well as of fire. Only one of the reasons, Simarine said thoughtfully. I don't like the sound of that. You'll be quite all right as long as you're with me, Kazul assured her. Very few things are willing to mess with the dragon, even in the dark. And the periods of darkness don't last long. It's because the magic of these caves doesn't affect us as much as other people, or so I'm told. You mean that blacklist blackness is likely to come back? Kazul nodded. Then let's get as far as we can before it does, Simarine said and started across the cave. There were four tunnels leading out of the opposite side of the glittering cavern. Kazul took the second from the left without hesitating an instant. Where do all the other tunnels, all these tunnels go? Simarine asked, glancing at the other three openings as she followed Kazul. The one on the right and uh, the one on the right end leads to a chain of caverns, Kazul said over her shoulder. The first few are quite ordinary, but when you come to one full of hot sulfur bowls, some of the older dragons bathe. But then you come to an old one full of hot sulfur pools. Some of the older dragons bathe there. 
They claim the water is good for rheumatism. Beyond that is a cave with molten silver dripping down the walls, and the chain ends at a deep chasm with a river of red-hot melted rock at the bottom. Doesn't sound very attractive, Simarine commented. The dwarfs find, dwarf smiths find it very useful for forging magic swords. The second tunnel, Kozula assured her, the second tunnel on the right takes you to a, into a maze. The tunnels and caverns constantly shift around, so that no matter how carefully you mark your way, you always get lost. Even dragons? Kuzul nodded. Though I believe there was one prince who managed to find his way out with a magic ball of string. Oh, bother, said Simarine. The lights had gone out again, just as they emerged into a small cave. It's quite all right. This part's easy, Kuzul said. Next time I'm going to bring a cane, Simarine muttered. Where do the other tunnels lead? The one on the far left goes through a couple of caverns that are pretty but not very interesting. We're always chasing knights and princes out of it, though. They come for flasks of water at the, from the bottomless pool at the far end. What does it do? Simarine asked. Ow! She had just banged her right elbow against the wall of the cave in the dark. It casts a cloud of darkness for twenty miles around when it's poured on the ground. And Kuzul replied, How useful. Simarine muttered balefully, rubbing her elfo, elbow. I get the feeling that she hit her funny bone. Hold on. Discord. Whew. Ah. And this tunnel leads to the Enchanted Forest by way of the King's Cave. Kazul finished. Oh, good. I was hoping to see that. Serene says, The King's Cave was the chamber where the first king of the dragons had found Colin's stone, and the Historia Dracorum had not described it anywhere near enough to suit, near well enough to suit Simarine. Oh, come on. Computer being full. That's fine, I can check it on my phone. Since it wants to be dumb. And here's the light coming back. Thank goodness. Let's hurry before it goes again. Well, that was a delayed reaction audio. They went through three small caves and two more periods of blackness before they reached the King's Cave. Kazul pointed out various locations of interest, such as the Wall of Crystal with a chip in one corner where, prince, where the Prince of the Ruby Stone had stolen a piece to make a magic ring, and a, in the jewel-studded cavern where the King of the Dragons met with people who needed impressing. There was one very eerie cave full of slabs of black rock. Most were standing on end, though a few had fallen over. Kazul said they were all enchanted princes. All of them? Simarine asked, appalled. There were at least 40 of the stone slabs, and this cave was quite crowded. Kazul shook her head. No, the one on the end there is just an ordinary boulder. How did it happen? The princess came to steal some of the water of, the, of healing from the cave at the end of the cave. From the well at the end of the cave. Kazul said. There are two dippers by the well. One is tin, and the other is solid gold, covered in, covered with jewels. The princes all tried to use the gold one, even though they'd been told that only the tin dipper would work. It's no more than they deserve. Simarine frowned, thinking of some of the princes she had known. 
Well, I won't deny that they probably behave foolishly, but foolishly, because <laughs> they'll start it. Any reasonably well-educated prince ought to have sense enough to follow directions when he's on a quest. But all of these fellows were sure they knew better. If they'd simply done what they were told, they wouldn't be here. Still, turning into slabs of stone forever seems a little extreme. Oh, they won't be stone forever, Kazul said. Sooner or later, someone will come along who has the sense not to improvise, and he'll succeed in getting the water. Then he'll use some of it to disenchant this lot, and the cave will be empty for a while until the next, ba next batch of young idiots start arriving. Samarine felt better knowing that the princess would someday be freed, though she had sense enough not to try doing it herself. Since she had not been sent on a quest for the Water of Healing, it was highly unlikely that she would be able to disenchant the princess even if she succeeded in taking the water. And she knew enough about quests and enchantments and the obtaining of things with magical properties to know that she would probably get into a lot of trouble if she tried. So she tucked the matter into the back of her mind and followed Kazul through the stone-filled cavern. She was careful not to step on any of the fallen slabs. Just outside the entrance to the next cave, Kazul stopped. This, she said, is the king's cave. We have to cross it as quickly as we can. Don't stop in the middle, and don't say anything while we're inside. Understand? Good. Come on, then. As soon as they stepped inside the cave, Simmerine understood the reason for Kazul's request for silence. The walls, the ceiling, the floor were made of dark, shiny stone that multiplied and threw back, threw back echoes of even the smallest sound. The soft scraping of Kazul's scales against the floor sounded like thirty men sawing wood. And the tiny gas Simmerine gave at the sight and sound of the cave was as loud as if she had shouted. Simmerine went on as quietly and carefully as she could. Halfway across, she noticed the vibration. It began and began as a gentle and not unpleasant buzzing in her bones. Unrelated to the sound and continually multiplying echoes of her passage. Sorry, hiccups. Though it too grew stronger and the farther they got the farther into the cave she went. Kazul was in front of her now, and she saw the dragon's tail lashed once as if in pain or anger. Suddenly, she remembered Kazul's description of the aura that made it impossible for most dragons to carry Colin Stone, and that this was the place that, where Colin Stone had been found. No wonder Kazul was uncomfortable. Simmerine found herself wishing she could stop and pay attention to the humming in her bones, but she remembered Kazul's directions and continued walking. She had nearly reached the exit when she saw a pebble about the size of her thumb, made of the same dark, shiny stone as the cavern walls. Kazul had said nothing about picking things up, so Simmerine veered a little to the right and scooped the pebble up as she, as she passed. A moment later, she was out of the cave. Phew, said Kazul. I'm glad that's over. From here on, it should be easy. Good said Simmerine. She dropped the pebble into her pocket to look more at more closely later and followed Kazul down the narrow winding tunnel. <clears throat> That's the end of chapter 7. I'm going to go get some water real quick. Um, my throat is hurting. I shall return momentarily.
my chair is so squeaky. And I'm back. <sighs> All right. Chapter eight, in which Simarine and Kazul pay a call and Simarine gets into a fight. A few minutes later, they came out of the caves of fire and night into bright sunlight. Simarine had to shade her eyes against the sudden glare. As her eyes adjusted, she saw a large clearing around the mouth of the cave. The ground was covered with short grass so lush and dense that it made Simarine think of green fur. Here and there, a tiny flower twinkled among the blades of grass. At the edge of the clearing, the forest began. But Simarine would only, could only make out the first row of trees. They were enormous, so large that they dwarfed even Kazool. Leave the lamp here, Kazool said. There's no sense in carting it around the forest when we won't need it until we get back. Simarine set the lamp on the ground just inside the mouth of the cave. Now what? She said, now we go to more ones. And we'll get there more quickly if you ride. If you climb up on that rock over there, you ought to be able to get on my back without too much trouble. Are you sure you don't mind? Simarine said, scrambling on up onto the rock that Kazul had indicated. I wouldn't have suggested it if I minded, Kazul said. Right there will be fine. You can hang on to the spike in front of, what, in front of you and you won't foul, foul my wings if I have to take off suddenly. Simarine did not like the implication that there were things in the enchanted forest that were nasty enough to make a dragon want to take off suddenly, but she did not say so. It was too late to back out, and she certainly wasn't going to wait at the mouth of the cave all alone while Kazul went off to visit Morwen. There was no reason to think that waiting would be any safer than going along. As soon as Simarine was settled, Kazul set off into the forest at a rapid pace. At first, Simarine had to concentrate on holding on, but after a while, she began to get the hang of it. So she was able to look at some of the things they were passing. The trees were huge. Simarine guessed that even if there were four of her holding hands, she would not be able to reach all the way around one of the trunks. The ground was carpeted with bright green moss that looked even thicker than the grass in the clearing. Simarine saw no flowers in it, but she spotted several bushes and a vine with three different colors of fruit. Kazul changed course several times for no reason that Simarine could see, and she did not like to but she did not like to distract the dragon by asking questions. They passed a mansion guarded by a fence made of gold and a short tower without any windows or doors. Then Kazul splashed through a shallow stream and made a sharp turn. The trees thinned a little and Kazul stopped in front of a neat gray house with a wide porch and a red roof. Over the door was a black and gold sign in large block letters reading, None of this nonsense, please. There were several cats of various sizes and colors perched on the porch, railing, or lying in the sun. As Simarine dismounted, Kazul said to one of them, Would you be good enough to tell Morwen that I'm here and would like to talk to her? The cat, a large gray tom, blinked its yellow eyes at Kazul. Then he jumped down from the porch rail and sauntered into the house. His tail held high as if to say, I'm doing this as a particular favor, mind. And don't you forget it. The way she writes cats is very accurate. <laughs> he doesn't seem very impressed, Simarine commented in some amusement. Why should he be? Kazul said, well, you're a dragon, Simarine answered, a little taken aback. What difference does that make to a cat? 
Sorry I'm all sniffly allergies. It's that most glorious time of year where allergies kick up. All right then. Fortunately, Simmerine did not have to find an answer, for at that moment, Morwen appeared in the doorway. She was wearing the same black robe she had worn when she visited Simmerine, or another one exactly like it. And she peered through her glasses with the air of someone studying an unexpected and rather peculiar puzzle. Good morning, Kazool, she said after a moment. This is a surprise. Good said Kazool. If you aren't expecting us to be here, no one else is either. That's the way of things, is it? Morwen commented thoughtfully. How much of a hurry are you in? Not much of one. As long as no one knows we're here. Kazool replied. Then Simmerine had better get down and have something to drink, Morwen said in a tone that forbade contradiction. There's cider or goat's milk. Though, if you want that, you'll have to get the cats after you. Or I can put a kettle on for tea. <laughs> Pardon me. Good gracious, what have you done to your hand? While Morwen had been talking, Simmerine tur had turned and slid carefully down Kazul's side. It was a long slide, and when her feet hit the ground, she had to put a hand uh, out a hand to keep from falling. Morwen's exclamation made her blink in surprise, and she looked down. The palm of her right hand was covered with blood from half a dozen deep slashes and as many scrapes. Oh dear, Simmerine said. It must have happened in the caves when it was so dark I didn't realize. I didn't realize. It doesn't hurt at all. Hurting or not, it needs attention, Morwen said firmly. Come inside, and I'll see to it while, that, while K Kazul tells me why you're here. You'll have to go around back this time, she added, turning to Kazool. The front steps won't take the weight. A gnome stole one of the supports, and I haven't had time to fix get it fixed yet. Pesky creatures. They're worse than mice. Don't the cats keep the mice away? Cameron asked, mildly puzzled. Yes, but they don't do a thing about gnomes, which is why gnomes are worse. Mind the step. And fun little thing, there's a, never a description of gnomes that I can remember in this series. So ever since I, and ever since watching uh, Troll Hunters, Tales of Arcadia, on Netflix, I kind of imagine these gnomes being literal, like, garden gnomes, like the gnomes in Troll Hunters. <laughs> They're described the same way. Pests. Yes, but they won't do a thing about gnomes, which is why gnomes are worse. Mind the step. Kazul started walking while Morwen chewed Simmerine up the wooden steps and into the house. Several of the cats eyed Simmerine curiously as she passed, and a tortoiseshell kitten got up and followed her in. The front door led into a large, airy room with an iron stove in one corner. There was a good deal of furniture, but everything except the table and the stove had at least one cat on top of it. Morwen frowned at a fat, fluffy Persian that was sitting on one of the chairs. The cat stood up, yawned, gave its front paws a cursory lick or two, just to show that this was all his own idea, and jumped down onto the floor. As Simmerine sat down on the vacated chair, there was a knock at the wooden door on the opposite side of the room. That'll be Kazool, Morwen said. She crossed to the door and opened it. Come in. I'll get you some cider as soon as I've seen to Simmerine's hand. Morwen's back door did not even seem to get any did not seem to get any larger, and Kazool did not certainly did not get any smaller. But when she put her head through the doorway, her scales did not even scrape the sides. And the rest of her followed with no apparent difficulty. 
and somehow there was plenty of room in the tall kit in the kitchen even after she got inside. Kazul settled down along the far wall where she would have would be out of the way, and as soon as she stopped moving, six cats jumped onto various portions of her tail, back, and shoulders. Neither Kazul nor Morwen seemed to notice. Morwen took a small tin from a shelf beside the stove and sat down at the table beside Simmerine. Excuse. Now, tell me what you're here for, she said, taking a roll of linen and two jars of ointments out of the box. Apart from my cider, I mean. Simmerine had some interesting visitors yesterday, Kazul said. If they were interesting, they can't have been knights, Morwen commented. They weren't, Kazul said. They were wizards. And they went to a lot of trouble to get a book a look at my copy of the Historia Dracorum, the part that describes the caves of fire and night. And you think that's why they've been sniffing around the mountains of mourning for the past six months? Morwen said. How did you find out what they were looking at? Or did they ask for <laughs> did they ask permission? I don't think Ziminar would ask permission for anything, even if he was sure he'd get it, Samarine said. He'd consider it beneath him. No, I saw him shut the book, and he was only a little further aloft, along from where I'd left my bookmark. Ow, that stings! Good, Morwen said. It's supposed to. She closed the jar of salve and began sm she had been smearing on Cimmerine's palm and began wrapping the injured hand in the linen bandage. Did Ziminar get what he was after? I don't think so. Samarine said. He said he wanted to come back for another visit, and I don't think he'd have done that if he had found whatever he was looking for. <sighs> that seems like a reasonable assumption, Morwen said. The wizards aren't always reasonable. There. That should take care of things. Don't take the bandage off for at least four days, and if you're going to cook anything that has fennel in it, stir it left-handed. That is a very, a highly specific instruction. I love it. <laughs> Ziminar's interest in Historia Dracorum isn't the only thing that points to his curiosity about the Caves of Fire and Night, Kazul said, and explained about the book that had been stolen. And there have been other incidents as well, and nearly all the wizards we've caught poking around have been somewhere in or near the caves. That's why no one thought much about it at first. Ever since King Toko's made the, that agreement with the Society of Wizards, they've been claiming they're supposed to have more time in the caves than, than we're willing to give them. Everyone thought this was more of the same. Not everyone, Morwen said, giving a Kozula a sharp look. I am widely considered to be unduly suspicious of everyone and everything, Kazul said in a dry tone, particularly wizards. And what do your suspicions make of this business? I think Ziminar is trying to find out something about the Caves of Fire and Night, Kazul said, something he hasn't been able to learn from visiting the caves in person. Hence his recent interests in histories that describe the caves, however briefly. And you're hoping I have something in my library that will help you figure out what it is, Morwen concluded. I don't hope, Kuzul said. I know, unless someone else has run off with your copy of de, Montmorency, de Montmorency's A Journey Through the Caves of Fire and Night. If someone has, he'll regret it, Morwen said. Wait here and I'll check. She rose and went out. Through the doorway, Simmerine could see a room full of tar tall, dark stained shelves. Simmerine blinked. Isn't that the door you came in through? She asked Kazul. Kazul nodded. Of course. I thought it led out into Morwen's yard. It leads wherever Morwen wants it to lead, Kazul said. I see, 
said Zimmerine, wishing her father's court philosopher were, here, were there. He was very pompous and stuffy, stuffy particularly about magic, which he claimed was 90% trickery and the rest illusion. Simmerine had found him very trying. Dealing with Morwen's, Morwen's door would probably have given him a headache. Morwen came back into the kid kitchen holding a thin red book. Here it is. I'm sorry it took me so long to find it, but the nonfiction isn't organized as well as it should be yet. Guzul surged to her feet, shedding cats in all directions. The cats gave her reproachful looks and then stalked out the front door with affronted dignity. Kuzul paid no attention. She curled her head around to peer at the book over Morwen's shoulder. I suppose you want to borrow it, Morwen said. I certainly do, Kuzul said. Is there a problem? Only if it gets stolen, Morwen said. There are very few of these, very few of these around, and I'm not sure I could replace it. I'll keep it in the vault with the treasure, Kuzul promised. Ziminar won't think to look for it there, and even if he does, he won't get in. I've got enough anti-wizard spells on the door to stop the whole society. They can't get in unless someone invites them. All right, Morwen said, handing the book back book to Kuzul. Is that everything you came for? No, said Kuzul. She looked at Morwen with limpid eyes and went on in a plaintive tone. I still haven't had any cider. Morwen laughed and went to one of the cupboards. She pulled out two mugs and a large mixing bowl and filled them with an amber-colored liquor liquid she poured in from a heavy-looking pottery jug. She set the mixing bowl in front of Kazool and gave one of the mugs to Simmerine, then sat down with the second mug herself. They were in Morwen's kitchen for over an hour, drinking cider and speculating about what the wizards were up to. After a while, several of the cats came back, and Morwen gave them a dish of goat's milk, which suited their ruffled feelings somewhat. I hope that the goat's milk was lactose free, because most cats are lactose intolerant. Fun factoid. My cat really likes uh, coconut milk. He's a kitty after my own heart. And he is not sitting up in his, on his bed. Okay. How is that fireproofing spell of yours coming? Morwen asked as she returned to the table. I have everything I need except powders, hen's teeth, and I'm beginning to think I'm never going to find any. Simmerine said, Kazul has offered to let me look through the jars in the treasury, but if there aren't any there, isn't any there, I don't know where I'll look next. Really, Morwen said, giving Kazul a sharp look. Well, if you can't find any hen's teeth, you could try substituting snake fingernails. Snake fingernails. Or the hair from a turtle's egg. I wouldn't try it, except as a last resort, though. Altering spells is a very tricky business. At last, they had to leave. Kazul went out the same way she'd come in while Simmerine watched in fascination. When, then Morwen, Simmerine and Morwen went into, onto the front porch. Kazul sidled up to the house, and Simmerine stood on the porch railing to climb onto her back. The cats were seriously affronted by this maneuver and expressed their displeasure in reproachful gla glances and low yowls. Don't take any notice, Morwen said. It only encourages them. Simmerine nodded. Thank you for everything. You're quite welcome, Morwen answered. Don't wait too long to come again. You'd better take this, princess, Kazul said, reaching back over her shoulder to hand Morwen's book to Simmerine. I can't carry it and run at the same time. Simmerine took the book and tucked it into her pocket. I'm all set she said, and they started off. Simmerine enjoyed the ba ride back to the Mountains of Morning. She was now sufficiently accustomed to riding on a dragon to be able to concentrate on looking at the forest that flashed past. The trees seemed almost identical to one another, 
but Cimmerine spotted a, quite a few odd-looking bushes and vines, and twice she thought she saw small faces staring out at her from among the leafy branches. They reached the threshold of the caves much sooner than Cimmerine expected. Kazul waited, Kazul waited while she slid to the ground and then said, The entrance is a little narrow. I'll go first and make sure there's nothing unpleasant waiting for us. Cimmerine nodded and Kazul vanished into the cave. Before Cimmerine could follow, she heard a shrill cry above her. She looked up and saw an enormous white blur bird plummeting toward her. Its clawed feet extended to attack. For an instant, Cimmerine was frozen by surprise and fear. Then she ducked and reached for her sword. She was almost too slow. The bird was on top of her, screeching and slashing before she had done more than grasp the hilt of her weapon. But the sword seemed to leap out of the scabbard as soon as she touched it, and she swung clumsily just as she rolled aside. She did not expect to do any damage, just to force the bird to back away a little. But she felt the sword connect and heard a wail of pain from the bird, thinking all her lucky stars individually and by name. Cimmerine twisted and scrambled to her feet, sword ready. There was nothing for her to guard against. The sword, effect, sword stroke had been more effective than she realized. The bird was dying. As she stared at it, she, it raised its head. You killed me, the bird said incredulously. But you're a maiden. Actually, she's a princess, Kazul's voice said from behind Cimmerine. My princess. So you'd have been in a even bigger trouble if you'd succeeded in carrying her off. I don't think I could have done it if I hadn't had a magic sword, said Cimmerine, who was beginning to wish she hadn't. She had never hurt anyone bef before, and she didn't like it. Just my luck, the bird said disgustedly. Oh well, fair is fair. You killed me, so you get my forfeit. You're not dead yet, Cimmerine said. If you'll let me be and let me near, I can try to stop the bleeding. Not a chance, the bird said. It was beginning to sound rather faint. Do you want the forfeit or don't you? Take it, Kazul advised. Cimmerine said nothing, but af and after a moment, the bird said, All right then, under my left wing, you'll find three black feathers. If you drop one and wish to be somewhere else, you'll find yourself there in the twinkling of an eye. Any questions? Can I take anyone else with me? Serene asked, thinking that if the bird was so determined to give her the feathers, she might as well cooperate with it. The bird looked at her with respect. The wonders never cease. For once a human with sense is getting the forfeit. Yes, you can take someone with you as long as you're touching him. Same for objects. If you can carry it, you can take it with you. You'll get one trip per feather, that's all. But, said Cimmerine, and stopped. The birds had fallen back, and it was clearly quite dead. Don't feel too bad, Kazul said perceptively. If it had succeeded in carrying you off, it would have fed you to its nestlings. Fed me to its nestlings? Cimmerine discovered that she had lost her sympathy for the dead bird. What a horrid thing to do! She hesitated. Won't the nestling starve now that the bird is dead? No, one of the other birds will take over the chore of feeding them for a few weeks until they're big enough to catch their own food. Now, Kazul said, now, clean that sword and take your feathers and let's get going. I want to have a look at that book of Morwens. Samarine nodded and did as she was told. The three black feathers were right where the bird had said they would be and she put them in her pocket with Morwen's book and the black pebble from the cave's fire and night. She wiped the sword on the grass several times, then finished cleaning it with her hand with her handkerchief. When she finished, she left the handkerchief beside the dead bird and followed Kazul into the cave's fire and night. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 9 In which Therindel is a dreadful nuisance. And Cimmerine casts a spell. Ugh. <sighs> the rest of the trip home was uneventful. Passing through the king's cave seemed easier going in the opposite. 
opposite direction, and the impenetrable darkness only descended once. As soon as they arrived, Gazul took the book Morwen had lent them and curled herself around a, cloth, a rock just in, outside the mouth of the cave to study it while Simarine made dinner. She pored over the book all evening, and Simarine found it fascinating to watch the dragon delicately turning pages with her claws. Early the next day, Kazul went off to consult with Roxen. Simarine was rather stiff from all the dragon riding that she had done the previous day, so she had so did she decided to not not to do any more cleaning. Instead, she spent the morning in Kazul's treasure room, sorting through likely looking bottles and jars for those that might possibly contain powdered hen's teeth. Remembering Kazul's advice, she started by setting aside all the bottles she could find that had lead stoppers. Since the light was not very good, she took the jars and bottles that looked as if they might be worth investigating and piled them in her apron so as to carry them outside more easily. She had nearly finished sorting when she heard a voice calling faintly in the dish distance. Bother, she said. I did hope they'd leave me alone for a little longer. She bundled the last five bottles into her apron without looking at them and not forgetting to lock the door behind her. Hurried her out through the maze to see who was shouting for her this time. It was Therindil. What are you doing here? Samarine said crossly. I told you I wasn't going to be ready to be rescued for at least a month. I was worried. Therindil said. I heard that you'd broken a leg, and but you look fine to me. Of course I haven't broken a leg, Samarine said. Where did you get that idea? Some night at the end, at the foot of the mountain, Therindil replied. He was up yesterday, talking to the princess he's trying to rescue, and he came back and warned everybody not to bother with the princess that was captured by the dragon Kazul. Well, I knew that was you, so I asked why. And he said his princess told him that you'd broken your leg and wouldn't be able to walk for months. Simarine smiled lightly, slightly. Alianora had apparently gone through with her plan to tell Helana about Simarine's twisted ankle. And Helana had decided to improve the story a little in hopes of, of reducing the competition. Somebody must have gotten mixed up, Simarine said gently. You can stop worrying. I'm fine. Is that all you came for? These jars are getting heavy and I've got work to do. Samarine, we have to talk, Therindil said in a deep, heavy voice. Then we'll have to do it while I work, Samarine declared. She turned on her heel and marched into the kitchen, full of annoyance. She had been feeling almost friendly toward Therindil. He had been worried about her, after all. Until he said he wanted to talk. Simarine was quite sure that he wanted what he talk wanted to talk about. Was rescuing her, and she was annoyed with him for being so stupidly stubborn and annoyed with herself for being annoyed when he was only trying to do the best he could. Therindil followed her into the kitchen. What is all that? He asked Simarine, as he asked as Simarine put the apron full of jars on the kitchen table and began lining them up. Some things I'm checking for Kazul, Simarine said. She picked up a small jar made of carved jade and pried the lid off. It was half full of green salve. Samarine put the lid back on and set the jar aside. What was it you wanted to talk about? She asked, reaching for the, another jar. You, dragons, us. That looks interesting. Can I help? As long as you don't break anything, Samarine said. Some of these are very fragile. Maybe opening jars would make him forget about you, dragons, us, for a while. 
I'll be very careful. Therindel assured her. This one looks like metal. I'll start with that, shall I? He picked up one of the larger jars made of beaten copper with two handles. He frowned at the top and reached for his dagger. And as he tilted the jar, Simmerine noticed, saw that the neck was stopped up with lead. Not that one, she said quickly. She didn't remember picking out that particular jar. It must have been one of the last four or five that she'd scooped up when she heard Therindel calling. Why not? Therindel said, sounding rather hurt. I said I'd be careful. The tip of his dagger was already embedded in the lead. Kazul said to leave the ones with lead, op lead stoppers alone, so put it back. If you insist, Therindel said, shrugging. He pulled on his dagger, but it was stuck fast in the lead. Drat, he said, twisting the handle. The dagger came free, and the lead stopper came along with it. I should have known, Samarine said in a resigned tone. A black cloud of smoke poured out of the jar. As Simmerine and Therindel watched, it condensed into a dark-skinned giant wearing only a turban and a loincloth. <sighs> he was more than twice as tall as Therindel, and the corners of his mouth were turned down in a stern frown. What is it? whispered Therindel. Trouble, she said there, Simmerine, said Simmerine. Thou speakest truly, O daughter of wisdom said the giant in a booming voice that filled the cave, for I am a djinn who was imprisoned in that jar, and I am the instrument of thy death and that of thy paramour. My what? Samarine said, outraged. Thy lover, the djinn said uncomfortably, the man who stands beside thee. I know what you meant. Simmerine said, but he isn't my lover or my fiancé or my boyfriend or anything, and I refuse to be killed with him. But, Simmerine, you know perfectly well, Therindel started. You hush, Simmerine said. You've made enough of a mess, of a mess already. If he is not thy paramour and any of, nor any of those other things, then what is he? The djinn asked suspiciously. A nuisance, Simmerine said succinctly. Simmerine, you're not being very kind, Therindel said. What he, ma what he is matters not, the djinn said grandly before, after a moment's heavy thought. It is enough that thou and he shall die. Enough for whom, Simmerine said. The djinn blinked at her. For me, tis my will that thou and he shall die by my hand. Thou hast but to choose the manner of thy death. <clears throat> Old age. Simmerine said promptly, Mock me not, thou and he shall die, and by my hand, ere this day draws to its close, the djinn cried. Do you suppose he means that? Therindel said nervously. Why would he keep bellowing it at us if he didn't mean it? Simmerine said. Do be quiet, Therindel. Therindel lowered his voice. Did I offer to fight him, you think? Don't be silly, Simmerine said. She saw that Therindel was distressed, so she added, You came up here to fight a dragon. You aren't prepared for a djinn, and nobody could reasonably expect you to challenge him. If you say so, Therindel said, looking relieved. Simmerine turned back to the djinn and, and saw that he too was looking perturbed. What's the matter with you? She said crossly. Dost thou not wish to know why I will kill thee? The djinn asked plaintively. What difference does it make? Samarine said. Yes, actually. Therindel said at the same time. Therindel! Samarine said in ass exasperation. Shut up! Hear my story, O oh luckless pair, the djinn said with evident relief. I am one of those djinn who did rebel against the law of our kind, and for the, my crimes I was sentenced to imprisonment in this bottle until the day should come when human hands would loose me. As is the custom of my people, I swore that whoso should release me during my first, the first hundred years of my imprisonment, I would make ruler of the earth. Whoso would, should release me during the second hundred years, I should make rich beyond all dreams of men. Whoso shall release me during the third hundred, I should grant three wishes, 
and whoso should release me after any longer span of time, I should grant only the choice of what death he would die. You're going to kill us because it's traditional. Samarine asked. Yes, the djinn said. His eyes slid away from Samarine's, and she frowned suddenly. Just how long were you in that jar? She demanded. Uh, well, actually, the djinn's voice trailed off. How long? Samarine insisted. 217 years. <laughs> The djinn admitted, but nobody ever releases a djinn before the 300 years are over. You're trying to get around your oath, Therindil said, plainly shocked by the very thought. You pretended you had to kill us so you wouldn't have to give us the wishes. No, the djinn said. Thinkest thou that the granting of wishes alone would so trouble me? Needs must I kill thee and thy fair companion, for I cannot return home and say that thou didst release me, and I left thee living. I would be a laughing stock. Never in three thousand years has such a thing occurred. Then you shouldn't have sworn an oath, Therindel said sternly. I had to. It is the custom of our kind. Twould be... Twould be... Improper, Samarine murmured. "'Twould be improper to do otherwise,' the djinn said, nodding. "'But now thou hast found me out. "'And what am I to do? "'If I kill thee, I, it will violate my oath. "'If I kill thee not, the remainder of my life will be in torment. "'You could go back in the jar for another eighty-three years,' Samarine suggested delicately. I could go back. The djinn blinked at her for a moment. I could go back. I could go back. And in 83 years, we'll both be dead of old age. Since that was my choice of death, your oath would be fulfilled, and you can go straight home without killing anyone else, or giving them any riches or power or anything. Truly, thou art a jewel among women and the very queen of wisdom's daughter. The djinn said happily, Thou hast found the perfect solution to my difficulties. Wait a minute. What about, Therindel said, What about those wishes? Therindel, Samarine said in a shocked tone, I'm surprised at you. How can he give us wishes if he's going back in the jar for 83 years? It wouldn't be right at all. Therindel frowned. Are you sure? After all, we did let him out during his third hundred years. I suppose I could let thee have one wish at least, in token of my thanks for thy help, the djinn said, as long as thou dost not tell anyone. I wouldn't dream of it, Therindel assured him, and my wish is to defeat a dragon and win, the prin win his princess's hand in marriage. The djinn waved a dark hand over, the dra over Therindel's head. There! When thou dost, when next thou dost fight a dragon, thou shalt surely defeat him, and thou. He said, turning to Samarine. I could use some powder tin's teeth, Samarine said. The tin blinked in surprise, but he waved his hand and again his ma face a mask of concentration. Then he bowed and handed Samarine a fat brown jar. There is thy desire. Farewell. With an elaborate salam, the djinn dissolved back into a cloud of smoke that poured back into the copper jar from which it had come. Simmerine leaned over and plucked the lead stopper from the end of Therindel's knife. She jammed it back into place and heaved a sigh of relief. Therindel was not paying attention. What did you want something like that for? He asked, looking at the jar of hen's teeth and wrinkling his nose in distaste. I don't believe I shall tell you, Samarine said, putting the jar carefully into one of her apron pockets. It has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with me? I like that, Therindel said indignantly. I'm going to marry you, just as soon as I beat that dragon of yours. I don't think you're going to beat Kazul, Samarine said in a considering tone. But that djinn just said, 
He said that if you fight a dragon, you'll defeat him. But Kazul is a her, not a him, Simarine pointed out. And you ought not to be trying to rescue me anyway. Why not? Therindel asked trustingly. Because there are other princesses who have been captives of dragon for as much longer than I have. And they have seniority. Simarine explained. Oh, there said Therindel, looking considerably taken aback. How do you know? They came to visit and told me all about it, Simarine said. I think you should try for Caridwell. She's from the King of, Kingdom of Raxwell, and her hair is the color of sun-ripened wheat, and she wears a golden crown set with diamonds. You ought to get along with her very well. Therindel brightens perceptibly at this, at this description, but said, But everyone expects me to rescue you. As long as you defeat a dragon and rescue a princess, no one will care, Simarine said firmly, and Caridwell will suit you much better than I would. Are you sure her dragon is a female too? Positive, Simarine said. Gornel's cave is two down and three over. If you follow the path outside, you can't miss it. He ought to be there now, and if you leave right away, you'll be able to get there, get everything settled before dinner. All right then, Therindel said. As long as you're sure you don't mind. Not at all. Simarine assured him fervently. She saw him to the mouth of the cave and pointed him toward Gornol's cave, then returned to the kitchen. She gathered up the jars and bottles she had been planning to check, except for the copper jars with the gin inside, and took them back to the treasure vault. Then she fetched a neat pot, a quill pen, and a sheet of paper from the library and began writing out a warning to attach to the copper jar. She didn't want anyone else to open it until 83 years, the 83 years were over and the djinn could go home without killing anyone. She was just finishing where she, when she heard Alianora's voice calling from the rear of the cave. I'm in the kitchen, she shouted. Come on back. You're always in the kitchen, Alianora said when she poked her head through the door a moment later. Or the library. Don't you ever th ever do anything but cook and read? Look at this, Eleonora, Simarine said, handing her the warning she had been writing. Do you think it's clear enough? Warning, this jar contains a djinn who will kill you if you let him out too soon. Do not open until at least 105 years after the date when the citadel of the yellow giant was destroyed. Eleonora read aloud. Let's, let's see. 84 years from now. It seems clear to me. You'd have to be pretty stupid to war ignore a warning like that. Maybe I ought to show it to Halana and see what she says. Marine said, frowning. I wouldn't want anyone getting into trouble by accident, just because I didn't make it plain. It's plain, it's plain, Eleonora said. Simarine, what on earth have you been doing? How do you know there's a gin in this bottle? Therindil, Simarine said, waving a hand impress expressively. I was looking through some of the bottles from Kazul's treasure rooms to see if any of them happened to have hen's teeth in them. And Therindel came in and wanted to help. And he opened it? Alan Nora said, Oh dear. Exactly, said Simmerine. But it came out well in the end. I think I've gotten rid of him for good. I sent him off to rescue Caridwell. You did? What if he doesn't beat Gornul? Well, oh, he'll win. The djinn gave him a wish, and he wished to defeat a dragon. Simarine looked apologetically at Eleonora. I suppose I ought to, have, ought to have sent him to rescue you, but it's quite all right, Eleonora said hastily. Getting rid of Caridwell will help a lot. And after everything you've told me about Therindale, I don't think I'd want to have him rescue me. That's what I thought, 
Cimmerian said. Oh, and I got the gin to give me some powdered, powdered hits teeth so we can finally try that fireproofing spell. Good, Eleonora said. Let's do it right now. I'm not back number. So Cimmerine got out the spell and the ingredients she had collected, and she and Eleonora spent the next hour on various necessary preparations. First, they had to boil some unicorn water and steep the dried wolfsbane in it. Then the mixture had to be strained and mixed with the hippopotamus oil and the powdered hen's teeth. Cimmerine did most of that while Eleonora ground up the blue rose leaves with, and the piece of ebony. Grinding the ebony took a long time, but fortunately, they didn't need much. When Eleonora finally had enough, Cimmerine mixed it with the blue rose, mm. mixed it with the blue rose leaves, and more of the unicorn water and one of Kazul's mm, recently shed scales. Each mixture had to be stirred three times counterclockwise with a white eagle feather. Then Eleonora dipped the point of her feather in her mixture and began drawing a star on the floor of the cave. Is this going to be big enough for both of us? She asked, scratching busily at the stone with the tip of the feather. I think so, Cimmerine answered. Don't try to make it too big or you'll run out of liquid and we'll have to start over. Eleonora did not run out, though she had used nearly all her mixture by the time she finished. There, she said. She sat back on her heels and studied her diagram to make sure there were no gaps, then set her dragon scale and feather aside and stood up. Your turn. First, we have to get into the center of the star, Cimmerine reminded her. Be careful not to smudge the lines. Smudge them? After all that work? Eleonora said in tones of mock horror. She lifted her skirts and stepped carefully into the middle of the diagram. Cimmerine followed and carried, carrying a small mixing bowl half full of something that looked like brown sludge with a white eagle feather sticking out of one side. It smells awful, Eleonora said, grimacing. It doesn't matter what it smells like, as long as the smell works. Ready? Cimmerine said. As ready as I'm ever going to be, Eleonora replied, shutting her eyes and screwing up her face as if she expected to have a glass of cold water poured over her head. Cimmerine plucked the eagle feather out of the bowl and raised it quickly over Eleonora's head before it could drip onto the floor. She let four large drops of the brown gunk fall onto Eleonora's hair, then brushed the end of the feather across her forehead twice. She finished by drawing a circle with the feather in the, on the palm of Eleonora's left hand. That tickles, Eleonora complained. Well, you can do it to me now, Cimmerine said. Eleonora took the bowl and feather from Cimmerine. You're right, Cimmerine said a moment later. It does tickle. Now what, Eleonora said. Set the bowl down and shut your eyes, Cimmerine instructed. When Eleonora had done so, Cimmerine closed her own eyes and said, Power of water, wind, and earth, turn the fire back to its birth. Raise the spell to shield the flame by the power that we have tamed. Oh, said Eleonora, that feels peculiar. Can I open my eyes now? Yes, Cimmerine said, opening her own. We're finished. Did it work? Eleonora asked, cautiously opening one eye and squinting at Cimmerine. Well, something happened. We both felt it, Cimmerine said. And your hair and forehead don't have brown gunk on them anymore. Eleonora promptly opened both eyes and studied Cimmerine. Neither do yours. What does that mean? It means we go back to the kitchen and test it, Cimmerine said. She bent over and picked up the mixing bowl. We'll clean up later. Come on. And that is the end of chapter nine. And those chapters were really short. So, or at least it felt like it. Uh, 
<sighs> that or I just read really fast. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, because I, I do three chapters a session, um, and I've got adult things to do this afternoon. Alright, so really quick announcements. Um, I am, um, of course we have a d and &D tomorrow night. Um, I'm probably going to play Final Fantasy XIV later and be streaming because I have quests to do and classes to unlock and sorry, playing with my new uh, new crystal. Rose Quartz Pyramid. He was just screaming at me. Of course, I also have this beautiful Iceland Spar Calcite Sphere. It's hard to see. It's not all that uh, easy to tell in the video, but it's a very pastel, almost white green color and the graining is very easy to lose yourself in. Sorry, I have a thing for crystals. Um, so yeah, after the adult things I'll probably be playing Final Fantasy 14 and then tomorrow is uh, is D&D Day. Um, So yeah, um, that is all the announcements. Uh, if you like my content, uh, I do have a link for Kofi donations, and um, always as always, uh, like and subscribe, um, like and follow, uh, subscribe on YouTube. Um, As I get closer and closer to being able to open up my home craft business, I will be potentially opening a Patreon to help fund additional features on my streams and uh, my business. Um, I have decided that the reward that the monthly rewards for my business for patreon followers will be um one free writing request a month of in short uh one short writing request per month um and a grab box of with uh, I'll put in the grab box I'll put one bath bomb one shower bomb one small candle and potentially a vial of moon water or sun water but that's a the water the sun or moon water is a potential thing because uh, various it will be some kind of special water probably um, I'll be get I'll be setting up a thing to gather rainwater, so I will 
be filtered. I'll have that fil be filtered and purified. And so it'll be sun, moon, rain, water, some kind of special spell property water because, um, yeah. So um, I will see you guys later for Final Fantasy XIV uh, or if I don't stream before then, D&D. Um, Peace.